previously, we looked at how we could build a simple memory circuit from NOR gates. Today we're going to look at how we can take this further and see how computer memory is built in a bit more detail. So if you remember the previous video, and if you haven't seen it, well, click the link below. We had this circuit here, which has got two NOR gates in it, wired so that the output of one NOR gate feeds back to the input of the other, and so on with the other one. We had two inputs to this circuit, S and R, which stood for set and reset, and we had two outputs, Q and Q bar, which was the inverted Q. If we took the set input high, the output went high, and it remained high even if the set output went low again. And the same with the reset thing, if we took that high, then it reset Q back to zero or low, and so on. The circuit remembered what state we put it in. So this is a useful circuit, it's referred to as an SR latch, but often we want to store not just setting a bit and resetting it, we'd actually want to store whatever data is on this line, which we'll call D for data. So we're going to have another input, which we'll call clock, and when that's high, we want it to remember whatever data is on D. So let's have a look at how we can map these inputs into the inputs of our previous circuit to do that. So it helps if we actually have a look at the truth table of what input we have coming in. So we've got our data bit coming in, and we have our clock signal coming in, and we're going to produce outputs S and R. Now, we need to map these to the outputs S and R. Whenever clock is zero, we don't want the values to change, so we want the output to S and R to be zero. Now, if the data's zero and clock is one, then we want the thing to be reset. So we want the reset pin to be high, so we want S to have zero output from it, and we want R to have a one output from it. If D is one and clock is one, then we want to change the value because the clock thing is high. D is one, so we want to set it, so we want to take S to be one and R to be zero. So we now know for all of our inputs what we want the outputs to be. And so we need to build a set of logic gates here that will map these inputs to the output here. And so we need to think of some circuit that is true for S when both D is one and clock is one. If you remember your logic gates, the simple circuit that is true when both of its input is true is the AND gate. So we can draw in an AND gate that's connected to the S pin and its inputs are the clock signal and the D signal. So when both of them are one, then the output is true, and so the set pin is taken high, and the output of this sets the circuit. We need to do the same to reset it, and we want reset to be one when D is zero and clock is one. Now in all circuits, no good, because if we ord them, then one and one would also be true, and we wouldn't want the reset and set to be set at the same time. So what we do is we use another AND gate, connect that up, clock signal, but we also need to have a signal that is true when data, or D, is zero. And so the easiest way to do that is to use a NOT gate like that and connect that into the circuit. Normally when we're writing circuits, drawing that out in full takes up a lot of space. So we just reduce it down to a simple rectangle. And this is what's referred to as a D latch. And the reason why it's called a latch is because when clock is high, then the output will follow whatever D is. It'll change as D changes while the output is high. When clock is low, the output is frozen or whatever it previously was. There is another type of circuit, which is called a flip-flop, which is drawn in very similar fashion. The difference with this, though, is that the data is only remembered when this transitions from being low to high. So when the signal on this input goes from being low to being high, so this is at low and this is at high, as it's changing, it remembers whatever the data is at that point there. And then the rest of the time it's fixed. And so it keeps that going until it goes high again. And it remembers at this point whatever it was when it changed from low to high. And both these circuits are used in building computers, but this one in particular can be used to build memory circuits that store things. So what we're going to do now is look at how we can put these together to build up memory for our computer. With a D flip-flop, we can store a single bit of information, but often on a computer, we want to store more than that. We want to store a byte, 32 bits worth, and so on. Or we want to have several bits, and we can choose which one we want to select. So let's have a look at how we can store more than one bit. Now, the simplest case to understand is when you want to store something like a byte, or a 32-bit word, or a 64-bit word, or even a 128-bit word, or something you get these days. Now, the way you do that is if you remember how binary numbers work, we store it as a series of bits. 
inside a computer, the data is stored along the various wires, and each bit is stored on its own individual wires. So if you look carefully on the back of this motherboard, you will see that coming off the processor here, you have lots and lots of wires that go together. Now some of these use to tell it where to store things, but others are actually carrying the data. We've got 16 lines on the motherboard which transfer the data between the various chips. Each wire stores one bit. So one wire stores bit zero, one wire stores bit one, and so on. So our circuit uses several wires to carry the data. Now if we wanted to store a 16 or 32 bit number, it's very simple. We're going to use four bits here just because it saves on drawing. So our input would be one, two, three, four input wires. And they'd be labeled something like that. And if we wanted to store, say, that four bit number, what we'd do is we'd have four flip flops. And we connect each of the data pins up to a different flip flop. But we now need it to store things when we wanted to. So remember, we had this input here, which when we took it from low to high, would store everything. Well, we just connect them all together, like so, like that. And then we have a single signal here, which we can use to tell it to store everything. So when we put the data on here, and transistor it one from low to high, all four of these flip-flops will remember that data. And our outputs here will be the data that we wanted to store. So storing multiple bits is really easy. We just have multiple flip-flops. Each flip-flop stores one particular bit of information. If we wanted eight, then we'd have eight flip-flops. If we wanted to store a 32-bit word, we'd have 32. Now, you can actually buy these pre-made. So what I've got here are three 8-bit registers, as they're called, because they can store eight bits. But they're basically just eight flip-flops with eight inputs and an input that we can use to tell it to store things, and then the eight outputs. And then you've got the voltage supply and the ground to actually power the chip. So that's how we can store multiple bits that are stored in parallel that make up, say, a byte or so on. And if we look at this uh, SIM that we took out of the Apple Macintosh, then we can see that there are eight chips. Now, you don't have to have them as separate chips, but often they are. So we've got eight chips here, and each one of these chips will be wired up to store a different bit of the byte. It doesn't have to be the case. If you look at some other SIMs, you'll find that perhaps only have two chips in, or perhaps even just one, and so on. It doesn't make any difference because the implementation is the same, but in this case, they actually used eight chips on the SIM to store things. So that's how we can store eight bits worth of a byte or a word. We just have eight single bit things in parallel. But if you've done any programming with computers or you think, you'll know that you can store more than one thing and you can address them all separately. And we'll look at that in another video. We'd like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this computer file video. And if you like books, you must check out Audible. If you go to audible.com slash computer file, there's a chance to download one for free. Now today I'd like to recommend Christopher Brookmeyer as an author. He's, he's an absolute genius in my mind. Try A Snowball in Hell, which is a really, really good book. If you like your novels dark, it's very clever, it's quite funny with a dark sense of humour, and it's well worth a read. So check out A Snowball in Hell by Christopher Brookmeyer at audible.com slash computer file. And thanks once again to them for sponsoring this computer file video. And if we slide the front out, we can start to see how it is the inside. So it's a CRT-based monitor, so you can see the tube at the back here. And you'll notice that I'm being very careful not...